Greetings. My name is Robin McCanns, and I am an assistant to the Bishop of the Southeast Michigan Synod. I bring you greetings from my bishop, Don Chris, and other members of our staff, Reverend Lauren Kirsch Carr, Reverend Sean Eubank, and Ms. Beth Fisher. Thank you for taking today to view this sermon and this worship experience, and I do pray that you find something, some little nugget to take away from today's message. Gracious and merciful God, God who birthed us and who birthed Shifra and Pua, who birthed Moses' sister and mother, who birthed the Pharaoh's daughter, God who is creator and parent to us all, thank you for these examples of moral authority, who you call to defy the powers and principalities so that your people could be led to liberation. May the Holy Spirit move through us today as we open our ears to hear you call each of us by name, directing us to lead and serve in unexpected spaces, transforming our limitations into possibilities. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Blessed by the Holy, Tr Holy Trinity, one God who creates, redeems, and sustains us and all creation. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Faithful God, have mercy on us. We confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We turn from your loving embrace and go our own ways we pass judgment on one another before examining ourselves. We place our own needs before those of our neighbors. We keep your gift of salvation to ourselves. Make us humble, cast away our transgressions, and turn us again to life in you through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. God hears the cries of all who call out in need, and through his death and resurrection, Christ has made us his own. Hear the truth that God proclaims. Your sins are forgiven in the name of Jesus Christ. Let, led by the Holy Spirit, live in freedom and newness to do God's work in the world. Amen. 
the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the Holy Communion be with you all and also with you. All, almighty and eternal God, you show perpetual loving kindness to your servants. Because we cannot rely on our own abilities, grant us your merciful judgment and train us to embody the generosity of your son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. reading from Exodus. The king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, one of whom was named Shifra and the other Pua, when you act as midwives to the Hebrew women and see them on the birth stool, if it is a boy, kill him. But if it is a girl, she shall live. But the midwives feared God. They did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them, but they let the boys live. So the king of Egypt summoned the midwives and said to them, why have you done this and allowed the boys to live? The midwives said to Pharaoh, because the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women, for they are vigorous and give birth before the midwife comes to them. So God dealt well with the midwives and the people multiplied and became very strong. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said to the disciples, the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for the vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for the usual daily wage, he sent them into his vineyard. When he went out about nine o'clock, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And he said to them, you also go into the vineyard and I will pay you what is right. So they went. When he went out again about noon and about three o'clock, he did the same. 
And about five o'clock, he went out and found others standing around. And he said to them, why are you standing here idle all day? They said to him, because no one has hired us. He said to them, you also go into the vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his manager, call the laborers and give them their pay, beginning with the last and then going to the first. When those hired about five o'clock came, each of them received the usual daily wage. Now, when the first came, they thought they would receive more, but each of them also received the daily wage. And when they received it, they grumbled against the landowner, saying, these last worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us, who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. But he replied to one of them, friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for the usual daily wage? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give this last, the same as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or are you envious because I'm generous? So the last will be first and the first will be last. The gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Good morning. I'm Pastor Beth Burkholtz. I'm the Director of Congregational Engagement for Samaritas, the former Lutheran Social Services of Michigan. And I, like many of you, have been learning the art of the pivot during COVID-19. My daughter loves the show Friends from the 90s, and so she's been watching it, uh, one might say obsessively, uh, since quarantine began. And I had not heard the word pivot so much um, since I had watched Friends back in the 90s with my college uh, roommates. You may recall there's a famous scene in Friends where they're trying to move a couch up the stairs. And as they move the couch up the stairs, um, they can't quite get it around the corner. And so um, Ross, in order to um, make everything very orderly, starts yelling pivot, and then he starts saying like they didn't understand, pivot, pivot. And spoiler alert, 20 years ago, it doesn't work, the pivot. I feel like that's been many of us um, in the past um, five, six months, what seems like much longer. We've been trying to pivot this couch up the stairs and people are yelling at us how to do it and what we should do and it's nearly impossible to to figure out how to pivot. So I've been hearing so much about pivoting and doing some of it myself. Um, my job at Samaritas depends on being face to face with people and being able to tell stories of providing homes. And as you know, that's been pretty difficult to do. So I'm thankful for this opportunity to be able to, uh, to speak to you, to share a little bit about a story that I love. Um, as well as tell you a little bit about um, what the reign of God uh, looks like um, in our little part of Michigan. The story of the midwives this morning to me is the story of a pivot. It's the story of these two women and what's really amazing about this story is that we hear their names, Shifra and Pua, and they're not named in relationship to any man, which is very unusual in the Bible. They get actual names. They get to be themselves, Shifra and Pua. There is a rabbinical tradition that these midwives were not Hebrew, but Egyptian. If that seems like splitting hairs to you, think about it this way. The Hebrew people were enslaved at this time. The Egyptians were not only the dominant culture, but they were the enslavers. So these Egyptian women were sent to help the Hebrew women give birth. What an odd position that would have been. So not only that, but later on when Pharaoh begins to fear that the Hebrew people are getting more and more numerous, he uh, comes up with a plan, a pivot one might say, an evil pivot, but a pivot. And he says, okay, I have a plan. Egyptian midwife, Shifra, Pua, um, if a boy is born, um, just go ahead and do away with him. Um, just, just kill the baby. 
Now, I don't know if any of you have met a midwife, but that is the total opposite of what midwives are uh, put on earth to do. They are on earth to bring life into the world. No matter what ethnicity they are, they are there to bring life. And so I can't imagine that this hit them very well as part of their jobs, even if they were helping women that were enslaved to give birth. And so they were faced with this impossible situation. If they refuse Pharaoh, their own lives could be taken. If they chose to go through with this, they would be taking life instead of giving it, which would be impossible for midwives to think about doing. It's kind of like <laughs> some of the impossible situations that we've found ourselves in. Maybe the stakes aren't as high, or maybe they are. We're faced with impossible choices about schooling our children, about protesting in the streets so that people can have life who are oppressed. And we're faced with all of these choices, and they just seem impossible. So when things seem impossible, I like to turn um, to the wisdom of Disney movies. In one of my favorite movies, Frozen 2, Frozen 2, not Frozen 1, Frozen 2, there is a song about depression. If you haven't seen it, I highly recommend it. There's a song about depression. And when everything seems impossible, when all hope is lost, the main character says, all I can do is the next right thing. We're faced with impossible choices, um, with pivots that seem ridiculous and impossible. Sometimes all we can do is the next right thing. What's the next right step to do? The midwives' next right step was to concoct a lie. Lying is usually frowned on in the Bible and by you know, nice Christian people, but in this case, lying saved lives. So they made up a story um, that is really, um, if you have uh, given birth or known someone that has, it's ridiculous, and yet this is the story they concoct when they are brought in front of Pharaoh, another impossible situation, and asked why, why are the baby boys still alive? I gave you the job, I gave you one job. They say, well, so here's the thing. The Hebrew women, they are super tough and they just go ahead and have a baby. Like they're out in the field, they just have a baby. We can't even get there by the time they give birth ever. Now, if you've ever, like I said, been around anyone who's given birth, this is completely ridiculous. Someone was going to have a hard time having a baby, and that's what the midwife is there for, is to help them. But they concoct this story because it seems like the next right thing. And shockingly, the pharaoh buys it. So the midwives are allowed to continue, one imagines, on their mission of bringing life into the world. These women who were enslaved um, were able to bring life, to have babies. This pivot just seems like an impossible situation. It seems like all of the choices that we have these days, is, if it's another day, then there's another pivot that's asked of us. There's another impossible choice in front of us. Do we do this? Do we do that? It's enough to keep us all up at night. But when we come back to doing the next right thing, the next right thing out of love for our neighbors, the next right thing to preserve life for people who are enslaved or oppressed, what is that next right thing for us to do? It doesn't have to be fair. Look at our gospel. Nothing's fair in the gospel. But it has to be the next right thing, the next step to take that preserves life. That's the loving thing to do to our sibling. In this uh, gospel text, it gives us a picture of the reign of God. And so in these stories, the reign of God looks like a group of women 
coming together in an impossible situation to do the next right thing, to be creative in the face of oppression and injustice. It looks like the, the reign of God, it looks like workers in a field that are standing around and because no one will give them work, and yet they're given enough to live on. They're given a day's wage. And that isn't fair. <laughs> None of this is fair. But it's the gospel. It's the way that we're called to walk and to live. Let us pray. God of all we lift up to you all those who are facing impossible situations. We pray for midwives, those who give life, and we pray for those who will ease people's passage into the next life. We pray for all of us that we would be able to do the next right thing to bring your kingdom, your reign here on earth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Drawn together in the compassion of God, we pray for the church, the world, and all of those in need. Generous God, you make the last first and the first last. Where this gospel challenges the church, equip it for its works of service. Strengthen those who suffer for Christ. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. Sun and wind, bushes and worms, cattle and great cities, nothing in creation is outside of your concern, mighty God. In your mercy, tend to all of it. Give us a spirit of generosity toward all you have made. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer where we find envy and create enemies, you provide enough for all. Bring peace to places of conflict and violence, especially throughout our own United States. For those in Palestine and Israel and at the U.S.-Mexico border. Inspire leaders with creativity and wisdom. Bless the work of negotiators, peacekeepers, and development workers. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Reveal yourself to all in need as you are gracious and merciful, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love, ready to relent from punishing. Accompany judges and lawyers, victims of crime and those serving sentences, and the families of both accusers and victims. Give fruitful labor and a livelihood to those seeking work. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Even beyond our expectations, you choose to give generously. Grant life, health, and courage to all who are in need. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We praise you for the generations that have declared your power to us. Give us faithfulness to follow them, living for Christ, until you call us to join them in the joyful song around his throne. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. All these things and whatever else that you see we need, we entrust to your mercy. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray. Praise and thanks to you, holy God, by for your word you made all things. You spoke light into darkness, called forth beauty from chaos, and brought life into being. For your word of life, O oh God, we give you thanks and praise. By your word, you called your people Israel to tell of your wonderful gifts, freedom from captivity, water on the desert journey, a pathway home from exile, wisdom for life with you. For your word of life, O oh God, we give you thanks and praise.
Through Jesus, your word made flesh. You speak to us and call us to witness. Forgiveness through the cross, life to those entombed by death, the way of your self-giving love. For your word of life, O God, we give you thanks and praise. Send your spirit of truth, O God. Rekindle your gifts within us. Renew our faith, increase our hope, and deepen our love for the sake of a world in need. Faithful to your word, O God, draw near to all who call on you. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, to whom, with you and the Holy Spirit, we be honor and glory forever. Amen. Now gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, how only be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.
God blesses us and sends us in mission to the world. Go out from here as workers in God's upside down kingdom, where the last are first and the first are last, where needs are met in miraculous ways and there is grace enough for all. And may the blessing of God, the love of Jesus Christ and the presence of the Holy Spirit surround you and sustain you in the days to come. Amen. Go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.